You know, friends, we're told in Prophets and Kings, page 626, that Christians should be preparing for what is soon to break upon this earth as an overwhelming surprise. Do you believe that? As an overwhelming surprise. And this preparation we should make by diligently studying the Word of God and striving to conform to its precepts in our lives. Do you believe that? Amen. Is that why we're here today? Amen. Safe to Serve International, those of you here who are locally, join me in prayer at this time. Father in heaven, There's a crisis brewing on the horizon. It's going to catch many off guard as an overwhelming surprise. But today, we're asking please that you will anoint our eyes with heavenly eye salve that we might see that we may see the signs in the world, the signs in the church that point to the close of human probation, the second coming of Jesus Christ. And we want to be found on your side. May we also examine ourselves to see if we are of the faith, lest we are labeled, declared reprobates. Even now, we're thankful for your prayers on our behalf in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. And as a result, we send our thoughts, our prayers to you right there. And even now, we pray that you will feed us with bread from heaven's bakery. We believe, we believe, Lord, help our unbelief. Bless us now, we pray. Revive those who are weary. Reform those of us who need full conversion, is our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 You know, friends, we have five segments that we're going to cover throughout this study this afternoon. And God has set the table. You know, the Bible says in Psalm 23, in Psalm 23, the Bible says that God prepares a table before me, before us, in the presence of our enemies. And what will he do? He will anoint our head with oil so that our cup will run over. Who wants that anointing today? Amen. You know, that's the message to Laodicea Amen. in Revelation chapter 3. I counsel thee to come buy of me the gold. Amen the white raiment, and then he says, and to anoint thine eyes with eyesal. It's the message to Laodicea. And friends, I want to share with you in the first fragment of this bread as God breaks bread with us today, and that is the leaders of this so-called movement, the pastors, administrators, and professors of this SDA movement without no conjecturing speculating, questioning, they have blood on their hands. Amen. As they have been promoting Caesar's, Pharaoh's inoculation, promoting Satan's nostrum, pushing these things while people are dying. The most recent Advent, Adventist record, April 21st, 2021, it says, headline, tributes flow for much-loved sanitarium employee. Janine Norris is being remembered as a fun-loving, happy woman, a committed Seventh-day Adventist Christian, and a much-loved sanitarium employee. What? What? What was her duties before she passed? Working at a sanitarium. Did God call the SDA movement to establish sanitariums? A sanitarium employee. Miss 
Norris, 48, died. She was 48, died in John Hunter Hospital in Newcastle, New South Wales, on April 14th after developing thrombosis, layman term, developing blood clots, layman term, low platelet count. Do you know what they blame? Next sentence, red words, the clotting was likely linked to what is that inoculation called? The two compound words. The first one, you know YouTube, Astra. Second word, Zeneca. You get the point, right? All right. We have some algorithms chasing us down. But in the name of Christ, we rebuke them. So she received that inoculation several days, a few days earlier, and what happened? She passed. Blood on their hands. Are you going to join the line? Are you next in line to receive that, po that prick? Blood on their hands. And the very same individuals are telling us that they champion depopulation. And what are they promoting? They don't want us to be around. They want to f make sure that we are dead. And notice the second fragment of this bread. Several days ago, I shared this with you, an open letter to South Pacific president regarding a preacher's defense of pederasty in sermon. What is pederasty? Do you know what it is? Sodomy. Homosexuality. Man with boy. Right there, friends. Sexual activity involving a man and a boy. A man and a youth. Also, we can call that pedophilia. Notice, and this is the response from the South Pacific president of Seventh-day Adventist. He said clearly, listen, I did my research, Red Arrow, I did my research, and I found out that pastor, his name, his name, I'll come back to him, that pastor, he simply mentioned pederasty as a passing comment. So it's okay. Because it was not the main intent of his message. Now here is uh, a most recent article, April 23rd, 2021, Fulcrum 7 headline, a third open letter to the South Pacific president of Seventh-day Adventists. Watch this. It says, however, this is uh, Claire Parker, and that's a pseudonym, all right? Claire Parker is also studying as a young person at uh, Ovendale College there in uh, Australia. Listen, however, I do not understand why you, Mr. President, seem reassured that it was just a passing comment. She says, surely, even a sermon that mentions pederasty does not fit in a story of Jesus. What was that pastor saying? That Roman centurion in Matthew chapter 8 that came to Christ saying, heal my son, the pastor said that that was the Roman centurion's lover in a sermon, in a Seventh-day Adventist pulpit. The, the author went on to say, uh, Sister Parker, would Jesus heal the boy of a sodomized boy and not set him free from the more powerful older man? Would Christ not have told both of them to go and sin no more? Notice, it says, and surely a public mistake. That was no mistake because once the, once the pastor, his name is uh, Mr. Stacy, once the pastor, pastor was confronted, he doubled down. It's a fact. That's what he said. And surely a public mistake requires a public correction or what? Public apology? No, I say a public rebuke. Could you please, Mr. President, clarify whether Avondale, that's the institution there of Seventh-day Adventists in Australia, whether Avondale accepts their public relations officer giving out Dr. Cole's notes saying, what does Dr. Cole's note say? Homosexual behavior was not prohibited by the Bible. Are we, are we in a crisis, my friends? 
So you're seeing the homosex, promoting homosexuality is leading to pedophilia. But we can blast the Roman Catholic Church and yet we are silent. When the same scenes are in our churches. Hypocrisy. And what did Christ say of Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes in Matthew 23? Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees. What's the next word? Hypocrites. Okay. It says, this Dr. Cole's doctor. Hmm, isn't that something, doctor? <laughs> Dr. Cole's note saying homosexual behavior was not prohibited by the Bible. And sending them from his Orvandale email address to my friend is Dr. Cole, who pushes these views, still an ordained pastor and conjoint senior lecturer at Orvandale? Question, Mr. President, is that acceptable under your leadership as the president of the conference? Hypocrisy, move on. My friends, this is more than hypocrisy. Watch this. The pastor who preached on pederasty, watch this carefully. It is clear that Orvandale has staff who are quietly influencing young Seventh-day Adventists towards full acceptance of LGBTQI relationships, as I hope to show you in coming days. Former students have contacted me saying they heard Dr. Graham Stacy. Watch this. Who? Dr. Who? Dr. Graham Stacy. Stacy. He said similar things in his classes at Avondale as his son whom? Brenton Stacy is now seeing. That's the father and son. Now, if the father was promoting homosexuality and pederasty, pedophilia, and the son is also promoting it, I wonder, I don't want to bring your man in the gutter. I, say it, my brother. I'm wondering if the father and the son are committing sodomic practices. That's why they can promote that publicly. And why would they do that publicly? Could it be because they know that there will be no consequences coming from upstairs, coming from the leaders of the conference in that region? Last sentence. If staff publicly and privately undermine the church's views, why should my tithe pay their wages? Why? And when we go to those churches, we are supporting and we are continuing such abomination to be taught and to be practiced in the very, very soon. Christ is going to shout, Ichabod, Ichabod, what does Ichabod mean? First Samuel 4 and 5, what does Ichabod mean? The glory is departed from Israel. Listen, she says, it is nice that you are a proud Mr. President, it's nice you are proud of your family history with Avondale. But please, take care to look what is really going on today. No one, no one had a prouder family history than whom? Eli. Eli's sons. But Ellen White says, Eli overlooked their faults. And what happened to Israel? What happened to Hophni? And Phineas, the sons of Eli. What happened to Eli himself? You know what happened, first Samuel. Please be a better leader than that. Go to Isaiah chapter 3 with me. Where are we going to, my friends? Isaiah chapter 3. And once we see them promoting sodomy, homosexuality, pedophilia in the SDA church. The Bible tells us probation is about to close. Isaiah chapter 3 confirmed. Look at verse 9. Verse 9. Isaiah chapter 3 verse 9. Sodomy in the church. And what do you find in verse 12? Women shall rule over them. Women's ordination. Are they connected? And verse number 13 says now, the close of probation. Verse 15, verse 16, the close of probation, my friends. Notice what this says. Now watch. My friends, it says uh, pederasty in what nation? 
Pederasty in Greece. Greece? Greece? Talk to me. What animal is used in Daniel 7 to represent Greece? What animal? Come on. The leopard. What is known? What distinguishes the leopard from other beasts in the field? Spots and friends. We are told Christ is coming for what church? Ephesians chapter 5. A church without spot, without a wrinkle, any such thing, but it should be holy and without blemish. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 through verse 27. Pederasty came from Greece. Now, you don't want me to read this. Watch this. It says, uh, the influence of pederasty on Greek culture of these periods was so perfect so pervasive that it has been called the principal culture model for free relationships between citizens. It says uh, some scholars locate pederasty's origin in initiation ritual, red words, where it was associated with entrance into military life and the religion of Zeus. Pederasty is the religious practice of Zeus. Who is Zeus? Greek mythology. Who is Zeus? It's pagan worship. The god of thunder, nature, lightning, etc. Zeus. And Zeus is just another name for Baal. Sun worship. Pederasty. And that's biblical. Go to 2 Kings 23. Put it down. 2 Kings 23. Put down verse 5. Put down verse 7. Verse 5 tells us it's Baal worship. Baal, sun god. Baal, sun god. Baal, another name for Zeus, my friends. Verse 7 mentions grove worship and sodomy. Verse 7, grove worship and sodomy. They go together. So what is being promoted in the SDH? It's right here on the screen. Sun worship, sodomy, the religion, and practice of Zeus. Let me tell you something, friends. There it is now. And what are the conferences, even NAD, promoting? Women's ordination. Oklahoma. I covered this. Texas. There it is, friends. Gender neutral. A woman can become a pastor, elder in the church, even becoming ordained. There it is. Right here, friends. Probation is about to close. And this is one of the reasons why Jesus in his day, when the Sanhedrin Council, which was the ancient name and group for the present day Seventh-day Adventist Conference, Jesus did not connect his ministry with the Sanhedrin Council at the first advent. And Sister White wrote, Phariseeism was prevalent in the general conference when she was alive. Watch this statement, my friends. She says, in 1901, she wrote this to, blue words on top, first line, to A.G. Daniels. A.G. Daniels was the general conference president. And she wrote red words. She says, Phariseeism in the Christian world today is not extinct. Contextually, it's the SDA church. Then she says, watch carefully, it is to advance without asking permission or support from those who have taken to themselves a kingly power. She says, the present showing is sufficient to prove to all who have the true missionary spirit that the regular lines, the SDA conference lines, may prove a what? A failure and a sneer. Now, do you have your handouts? I'm in the fourth segment now of the bread, the fourth slice, the fourth uh, fragment. Everything on your handout, I'm going to share with you on the screen. Because you have your handout, I'm not going to read every paragraph verbatim. I'm simply going to give you the overview. Make sense? What I'm sharing with you is simply prophecy being fulfilled. 
it shows us urgency. Probation is about to close. And if we are going to be faithful to God in accomplishing aggressive, effective evangelism, we cannot connect ourselves with the modern day Sanhedrin Council, the modern day Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes. They will prove to be a failure and a sneer. Those of you online, Save to Serve International, below this video in the description box, click on that PDF link, you'll see the handout. Amen, brother. You will see this handout here. You have it. All right, friends. Thank you, brother. Let's go. Listen to what this says. It's rife in the SD. Have we changed since? Listen to this. She says, remember now, Sister White says, Phariseeism was prevalent in the church. All right. Who comprised the Sanhedrin Council? We are told the Pharisees and the Sadducees made up the Sanhedrin Council. Is that point clear? All right. Notice now, friends, it says the Sanhedrin Council, red words, had a high priest who was called the president. What do we have today in the General Conference, North American Division, etc.? We have president, presidents, and also a General Conference president. The modern day Sanhedrin Council. Next. It says, watch, this paragraph says, look at the screen, preacher. Amen. Look at the screen. It says, watch carefully, friend. It says, if the Sanhedrin Council, the leaders, had been faithful to God, accepting Christ and present truth, Jesus would have used the Sanhedrin Council as the foundation for the Christian church. But because they rejected Christ, rejected the apostles, slew, martyred Stephen, they were not used as the messengers to receive the former reign and to give the gospel to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part of the earth. So question, who is Christ going to use to receive the latter reign? At the Sunday law crisis, who will he use to give the loud cry? At the first advent, the Sanhedrin council was bypassed. Bypassed. Who will he bypass today? <laughs> you watch. It says, next paragraph, it says, Jesus, watch carefully, the Sanhedrin had rejected Christ's message and was bent upon Christ's death. Therefore, Jesus departed from where? Jerusalem. From whom? The priests. From what? The temple. From whom? The religious leaders, the people who had been instructed in the law and turned to another class and use them to proclaim the gospel. Who comprise the other class? The disciples. Does that make sense, my friends? Amen. So now those who tell you, you have to be connected with the general conference of churches, they are grossly ignorant. By the way, that's too soft of a term. They are intentionally deceiving people. Watch. This paragraph says in Daniel 9 and verse number 24, how many weeks did the Jewish people have to accept Christ or else probation would close upon them? 70 prophetic weeks. Do you know it was the decision, right here, red words, at that time, red words, to the action of the Jewish Sanhedrin, the nation sealed its rejection of the gospel. So who was the actual leaders of the Jewish nation? The Sanhedrin Council and their action caused probation to close on the Jewish people. Type, anti-type. Notice, next paragraph goes on. I, I, I have to read this one. It says, as the light and life of men was rejected, the ecclesiastical authorities in the days of Christ so it has been rejected in how many? Every succeeding generation. Again and again, the history of Christ's withdrawal from Judah has been what? Repeated. 
when the reformers preached the word of God, they had no thought of separating themselves from the established church. Mercy. But the religious leaders would not tolerate the light. And those that bore it were forced to seek another class who were longing for the truth. In our day, whose day? In our day, few of the professed followers of the reformers are actuated by their... So what is Sister White saying? The few, the remnant in the last days must also have this experience of the reformers, not just their message. What you're seeing is the message of the reformers caused them to separate from apostasy. Not so much so apostasy among the people. You'll always have wheat and tears. But apostasy among leaders. Those who are promoting false doctrines, homosexuality from the pulpit. And when they are confronted, they double down. It says, few are listening for the voice of God. And ready to accept truth in whatever guise it may be presented. Often, those who follow in the steps of the reformers are forced to turn away from the churches they love in order to declare the plain teaching of God's word. And many, and many times, those who are seeking for light are by the same teaching, let's read, obliged to leave the church of their fathers that they may want. Render obedience. Next. Paragraph, my friends, have you ever heard people say, don't leave the conference churches even when you know your pastor and leaders, elders are in apostasy. They say, if you were to leave the conference churches, you're not in God's church. Yes. Let me tell you something. That theory is Roman Catholicism. Amen. That quote, GC 181, is on your handout. Go ahead and read that. That's Roman Catholicism. Let's move on. Again, I can simply paraphrase. You have the handout. Listen, it says, Jesus, do you want to hear from men or Jesus? Jesus. What did Christ say in John 15? John 15, verse 1, I am the true vine. All right, friends. It says, this paragraph says, Jesus said, the Jewish people were called a vine. And many believed that because they were connected to the Jewish church, that would save them. Jesus says, uh, your connection with the Jewish church cannot save you. It's your connection with me, your Savior. It's right there, my friend. Amen. Who wrote that? Sister White. So all these quotes they're using, they're misinterpreting God's word. Amen. When you compare and you conflate the Bible's principles with the spirit of prophecy, that's how you find truth. Beware of those who only want to give you spirit of prophecy quotations. Amen. They want to misinterpret them, misapply them, to lead you as blind people following them as blind guides. And Jesus says, both shall fall here into the ditch. Amen. And by the way, that place is not a pleasant place. You're lost. Look at this now. We are told John the Baptist did not recognize the Sanhedrin Council. That means a conference. He did not ask them for their sanction for his ministry. Second paragraph, in the natural order of things, John the Baptist should have been a pastor, a priest within the Sanhedrin Council. But God says no. Look at this now, Jesus, third paragraph, Jesus did not seek the sanction or approval from the Sanhedrin council of that day. Who are we going to follow, man or follow Jesus? Which one? Matthew 16. Do you remember Christ said upon this rock, I will build my what? Church and the gates of hell shall not what? Prevail against it. I want to ask you a question. Who did Christ label? His church in Matthew 16. The Sanhedrin council or the disciples, the few? This quote says, it's on your handout, it says it was the disciples. 
Those who are following the truth are God's church, not a conference of churches. Amen. All right, friends. All right, next paragraph. It was the 12 that Christ called his church, not the Sanhedrin Council. It's right there. You have it. Check on it. Be like the Bereans. Next paragraph. Again, notice. These men, Christ is this one, Christ, it says, bypassed the Sanhedrin council and chose the 12, blue words underlined, and chose the 12 as leaders in his church. Next, it says, watch carefully, friends. Let me pass that one. It says, Jesus, watch carefully, Jesus. Red words, it says, these who have never been to the rabbis, who had never sat in the schools of the Jewish nation, who had not been members of the Sanhedrin, Christ chose as his church. Those who were not connected as members of the Sanhedrin. So when Sister White writes now in volume 9 and page 48, let people and ministers bear in mind the mere fact that their names are registered on a church's book will not save them. Amen. Come on, friends. Follow truth. Amen. By the way, it says many were in the Sanhedrin Council, the conference, and refused to accept Jesus and present truth. Why? They were afraid, red words, they were afraid of being turned out of the Sanhedrin. And Sister White says, blue words, are there any here today who say, if I were living in that day, I would not unite with those who cried, crucify him. Sanhedrin Council. She says, well, prove it now by obeying the light of today. What is she saying? What happened in John 12, verse 42? What happened at the cross is going to be repeated. Who are we going to follow, my friends? Hold on. Do you remember in John 9, what happened to the blind man who came seeing? As he accepted Christ, what happened? Was he cast out of the synagogue, the Sanhedrin council? Yes. But what happened? Did Christ meet him later on? Did Christ say, no, no, go back and sit under the Pharisees? No. Go back and sit under the Sadducees. Is that what Christ said and did? That Christ said, go back and beg them to take you back. Beg them to keep your name on that church's record. Is that what Christ said? The Bible says uh, the man worshipped Christ and Christ accepted his worship. It's on your handout. By the way, as I close, who was Joseph and Nicodemus? They were pastors, priests, rabbis among the Sanhedrin council. Did they accept Christ before he was crucified? No. Why not? Why not? They knew if they did that, they would be what? Excluded from the Sanhedrin. And those who preach all of present truth... All of the everlasting gospel, the three angels' messages exposing the sins in the world, the sins in the church, and call men in the world to repentance, men in the church to repentance publicly because of their public sins are going to be ostracized and then silenced. So what do they do? Only if they talk about sins, only those in the world but never in the church. By the way, watch this. What, what did they do to Saul? Who oversaw the martyrdom of Stephen, his name? Saul. What did the Sanhedrin do to, King so do to Saul, who became Paul, not King Saul? What happened? They gave him a high position because of Saul's actions in trying to silence present truth. They give him a high office. It's right there, friends. High office. Next, the Sanhedrin. They also place spies on the tracks of those who are teaching and presenting present truth. What will happen in the last days, my friends? And yet probation is fast closing. This past week, 
they had what they called, what was April 22nd? You tell me. Earth Day. Is Earth Day biblical? Earth Day is pagan, friends. If there was ever, if, if, if there was ever an Earth Day, what day is it? The seventh day Sabbath. But we don't even talk about, remove the if. There's no Earth Day, amen, my friends? And now we have the Pope's envoy saying, COP26, November 2021, the main aim is to enforce Sunday worship by law. And yet, what is the condition of the church? This movement grows up. Apostasy is in the midst. It's time, my friends, for revival and reformation. Amen. Hold on, hold on, hold on. When the sun, the law is passed. By the way, let me give it to you. Is it right there? Second slide. Yes, there it is, friends. When the sun, the law is passed. Question, who is going to be tested first? The world or the church? It's professed Seventh-day Adventists who shall be. I'm in my last segment now. It's the church professed SDAs who shall be tested first. Why? Because we understand what the son the law means. Does it make sense, my friends? Does it make sense? And friends, we are told at that very point, those who make the wrong decision, probation closes on them first. Watch this. Volume 9, come off my screen. Volume 9, page 97 says, uh, The time is nearing when the great crisis in the history of the world will come. Do you believe that, my friends? All right. Oh, that God's people might know the time of their visitation. There are many who have not yet heard the what, friends? The testing truth for this time. Listen to this, friends. There are many with whom God's spirit is still striving. Pause. Do you have an aunt, an uncle, a mother, a father, a grandmother, granduncle, granduncle? You get the point. Do you have family members who are not yet Seventh-day Adventists? Yes. But they are professed Christians? <laughs> Hold on. And they are serving God with the best light they have now. I wonder if they are going to be brought into present truth. I'm wondering. Now, secondly, uh, that same group, family members, I'm wondering if when we come to them and we are teaching them Bible truth, even God's Sabbath, and now they are rejecting. I'm wondering if their rejection now is providential. Because if they were to come into present truth now, we would spoil them. That's my theme for the last segment. There's hope. Watch. Listen, blue words. The time of God's destructive judgment is a time of mercy for those who have had no opportunity to learn what is truth. Tenderly will God look upon them. Let's read another last line. What it says, my friends, his heart of mercy is touched. His hand is still stretched out to save while the door is closed to those who would not enter. Does that statement say probation will close on one group? before it closes upon those in the world. Yes. Probation's closing is progressive. And when the sun, the law is enforced, while apostate Seventh-day Adventists have their probation closed, it's still open for those in the world. Because those who make the correct decision at the passing, of the son the law, they are sealed by God. Amen. Amen. What do they then receive from God? Amen. They receive the latter rain. Heavens, meteorologist says, that there's rain in the forecast. And once we receive that latter rain, is it for us to sit down and be reticent or shy and complacent at ease? What is the mission then, my friend? To give the loud, come on, talk to me. To give the loud cry 
the final message to the world. Amen. Now you Seventh-day Adventists and even first-time viewers and those of you who are here for the first time, do you know where the final warning is in the Bible? I'll give you a hint. In the book of Revelation, where is it? Where is that last warning to the world? Where, my friends? Revelation 14, verse 9, verse 10. Where else? Go with me. Revelation chapter 18. Let's study our Bibles now, friends. Where are we going to? Revelation chapter 18. Look with me. Verse number 1. I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was what, friends? Lightened with his glory. And what does he cry in verse 2? Who is fallen? Fallen. Talk to me. Who, my friends? Babylon. Go to verse 3. What gender is given to Babylon? What gender, male or female, what gender is given to Babylon? She has made all nations drink of her. It's a female gender. Hold on, I'll come back to that. Go to verse 4. What does verse 4 now say? Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. All right, friends. How do you know that's the last warning? Based on verse 4, how do we know? Or was it because I said so? How do you know? Okay, it coincides with the three angels of chapter 14. Or what else? Plagues. Plagues. And when the plagues fall, probation closes. Amen. It's the final warning question. Which event is the catalyst for the plagues? The mark of the beast, Sunday by law. What text say that? Come on. What text says, uh, mark of the beast, then plagues. Mark of the beast, then plagues. Come on. What text say that? Revelation 14, what verses? 9, verse 10. What else? Chapter 15, verse 1. Put that down. Chapter 15, verse 1. With chapter 14, verse 9, verse 10. Also write down Revelation 16, verse 1, verse 2, 16, verse 1 and verse 2. The mark of the beast. Then comes the plagues. It's the final warning. Jesus says 9, verse 4, come out of her, my people, her, a female gender. What does a woman represent in prophecy? Oh, that was beautiful. Now you know what I'm going to ask you next. <laughs> Give me the scriptures. Come on. If I'm preaching, I would go on already. Past this point a long time ago. But friends, I, I don't want to speak over your head. I want to speak to the mind. Train. Amen. My brother, what's that scripture? Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25. A woman represents the church. Now, give me a second scripture. Woman church. Jeremiah 6 and verse 2. That was both of you. Do you have one more for me? A third one. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse number 2. Come out of her. A her woman is a church. Now, is Christ calling us out of a good church? Pure church or an abominable apostate church? Which one? The latter. It's Babylon verse, based on verse 2. It's Babylon. Now, I'm going to give you a very quick identification of Babylon. Look at the screen. If, oh, past that. Evangelism, page 365 says, the fallen denominational churches are what? Babylon. Listen. Babylon has been fostering poisonous doctrines, the wine of error. This wine of error is made up of what? False doctrines. What principle? False doctrines such as what? The natural immortality of the soul. Pause. How many of you have family members who go to Sunday keeping churches and they believe the dead is conscious? In heaven, 
You have been to funerals of dead family members and those Christian other Christian family members came to the funeral. Oh, I'm so glad, uncle, my aunt is looking down on us. Babylon, all right, what else, my friends, comprise the false doctrines, blue words, the eternal torment of the wicked. What else? The denial of the pre-existence of Christ prior to his birth in Bethlehem. Let's read now the red words at the bottom. What it says, my friend, and what? Advocating and exalting what? The first day of the week above God's holy sanctified day. Babylon, these and kindred errors are presented to the world by what, friends? The various churches. Babylon. All right. Go back to verse 4. Watch carefully. Come out of her, my people. Come out of Babylon, my people. My friends, pause. Write this text down. Revelation chapter 18 and verse number 4 is connected to John 10 verse 16. Do you recall Christ saying a phrase similar, come out of her, my people? Let's cut the chase. John 10, 16, Jesus says, and other sheep. That's a good start. Finish it. I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring. How will he bring them? They will hear my voice. And there shall be how many folds? One fold. How many, Lord? How many shepherd? One shepherd. John 10. Go there with me. That means John 10, verse 16, is the type, the foundation for Revelation 18 and verse number 4. John chapter 10. Where are we going to, my friends? Let's dig a little deeper here. John chapter 10. Look with me at verse number 16. Now, who do you think sheep represent? Break it down. Analyze. Take your writing instrument. Write down sheep beside John 10, 16. Who do you think the sheep would represent? Sheep. People. Christ is not talking about little lambs, my friends. All right. Sheep or people. Now, what about Psalm 100? Verse 3. Know you not the Lord, he is God, right? We are his people and the sheep of his pastor. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. Sheep represents whom? People. Put it down. Psalm 100 and verse 3. Jesus says, are the sheep of the people. I have which are not of this fold. So what would the fold represent? Church, you're correct. Put down fold, F-O-L-D, fold, and put down Psalm 50 and verse 9. Psalm 50, verse 9. God's word says, my friends, the fold is a house. Psalm 50, verse 9. The fold is a house. All right, next step, house. What does God's house represent? The church. That's it. House, the church. What scripture is that? Put down 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. Go now back to John 10, 16. And other sheep. What's the word now for sheep? Come on, friend. Other what now? Other people I have who are not of this fold. What's the fold? church them also i must bring they will hear my voice and there shall be one fold one what one church my friends and one what one shepherd one savior one god one lord Amen. that's it my friend. is he gonna bring them how is he gonna bring them how is he gonna bring them when will he bring them completely revelation 18 verse 1 through verse 4 after the son of the law is passed, the other sheep are coming into present truth. The other sheep are coming in to present truth. It may be your uncle 
who is not now a Seventh-day Adventist. Your aunt, your brother, your sister, your grown son, grown daughter, who are not now a Seventh-day Adventist, the other sheep are coming in. Here's a warning to other sheep. Don't wait until the son of law. If you hear the warning now, come into present truth now. Jesus says in Acts 17 and verse 30, in your ignorance, God winks. But when truth comes, he expects repentance to turn. Remember, Judas Iscariot did not know that night was his final opportunity. What did Jesus say to Judas? What thou doest, do quickly. He thought it was a joke. What happened? He walked out of that upper room and the Bible says it was day. It was, it was what? It was night. His probation had closed. Here's my point. Are the sheep? You don't know if today is your day to give up Sunday keeping and other kindred errors and accept true Sabbath keeping based on the Bible and accept present truth. Why? 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 2 says, watch carefully, today, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. I asked God the question, so why are you going to allow the other sheep to come in after the son of the law? And God showed me, because if I were to allow them to come into present truth now, many of us who are unconverted will literally discourage them and they will leave the faith. Amen. Volume 6, page 370, it says, watch carefully. The Lord does not now work to bring many souls. That didn't say into the church. That did not say into the church. Because when the other sheep are coming in, post Sunday law, if there is a conference of churches in Maryland, in the spring, 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 Silver Spring, or the other one in Colombia, or you know what I'm talking, that means they are buying and they're selling. And remember, after the cross, the Sanhedrin Council was still active. Do you see the point? But the true church were scattered. Do you see that, my friends? And the, organi the organization was a spiritual one. Not one paying electric bill, the lights, making sense, paying a mortgage, right? No, that structure was passed by, left desolate. So now, the other sheep who are coming in, they are coming not into our SDA conference building and churches, but into what? Truth! Amen. That's type, that's Bible and spirit of prophecy. Watch this, sir. It says, the Lord does not now work to bring many souls into the truth because of the church members who have never been converted. So how are you church members? It hurts. The church members who have never been converted and those who were once converted but who have backslidden. What influence would these unconsecrated members have on whom new converts would they not make of no effect the God-given message which God's people are to bear? My friend, I don't want you to say, that's right, those people. No. Turn the flashlight within. Amen. Lord, help me not to be a member who has never been converted. Help me not to be an SDA church member who were once converted, but now have what? 
backslidden back to the world. So you can trust me as a steward of the other sheep who are coming in. Christ wants to bring some in now. Now. We are family members. He wants to win now. Okay. Does the Bible show us who the other sheep are who are coming in? And then we will see the family members who are coming in. Does the Bible show us? Yes. As we study, those who came in under the former reign, we will understand those who are coming in under the latter reign. Ready for the study? Go to Acts 1. Acts chapter 1, look with me. Friends, God had to send persecution, what's that word? Persecution to get his people to accomplish aggressive, effective evangelism under the former reign. Hear me, friends. Let's not allow God to have to send fire under our skin to get us to evangelize. No. Save to serve Knoxville, local, just bear with me. As we weep and pray to God, fast and pray, Lord, open up some doors for us. Just, just, just wait. He'll do it, friends. Because yes. other sheep have to come in. Yes. He'll do it. Amen? Acts chapter 1, go to verse 8. Amen. Verse 8. What three nations are mentioned in verse 8? Of Acts 1, give me them. Jerusalem, next. Judea, next. Samaria, okay. What were they to receive? The apostles, verse 8, come on. The Holy Spirit's power. And now they were to go here? Did they go? No. Did they go? Not until Christ sent persecution. Go to Acts chapter 8. Where are we going to, my friends? Go to Acts chapter 8. Look with me at verse number 1 of Acts 8. Scan Acts 8. Scan Acts 8. What came upon the believers? Acts 8 verse 1. Great what? Great persecution. And where did the apostles go? What three places now? Jerusalem. Jude no, no, no. They fled from Jerusalem and had to go where now? To where? Judea and where? Samaria. He had to send persecution to get them to aggressively evangelize once they receive the former reign. Receiving truth and the Holy Spirit is not for you to have a comfortable seat in church. Amen. Does that make sense? Yes. And for you online to sit comfortably at your home and simply say, oh, just one more Sabbath. Let me go to this ministry's website. Oh, beautiful sermon. Next. Beautiful. Next. Next. Oh, it's lunchtime now. Eat lunch. Oh, it's nap time now. And then, oh, the sun is going to set. And it's a cycle every single week. And from Sunday to Friday, you're busy here and busy there with the job and have no desire for evangelism. Mm. God is going to have to send what? Persecution, my friend. To awaken us to do aggressive, effective evangelism. Go to verse 5. Verse 5 now, and where did Philip go? We are now, friends, Samaria. Hold on. In Acts chapter 8, Philip went and met and meet with somebody. He was riding in a chariot. Tell me, who was that person that Philip met? The Ethiopian. You know, was he brought into truth? That means the Ethiopian eunuch represents the other sheep coming in. Once the latter rain falls, my friends. Now, tell me something about what you remember about the Ethiopian eunuch. I'm waiting. What do you remember about him? He was what? He was studying diligently God's word. What else? He was seeking for understanding. What else? You know. I'm looking for something. What? 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 Come on. He was seeking baptism. Okay. What else? My friends, the Bible tells us the man, the you know, he was seeking to worship God in truth. 
and as a result, he readied his chariot. And where he went? Jerusalem. Gallop, 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 gallop. Jerusalem. And when he got to Jerusalem, the Bible and the spirit of prophecy say he left ignorant and confused. Watch this. Go to verse 26 of Acts 8. Read slowly. It says, and Philip now, God said to Philip, Philip, arise, go down to Gaza, the desert. Come to verse 27. It's key. And Philip arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority on a Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure. Everybody, read the next phrase, what it says. And had come to, had come to where? Jerusalem for to worship. Next verse was returning from Jerusalem and sitting in a chariot. And what was he reading? The prophet Isaiah. Look at verse 34. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee of whom speaketh Isaiah, of himself or some other man. The man went to Jerusalem to learn of Jesus and to worship and left ignorant. I don't know. Who is this person here in Isaiah 53? Who is he? And in that time, there was only the Old Testament. There was no New Testament. Look at this statement now, my friend. It says, the eunuch in his blindness had been groping for light. For light. He believed the scriptures, but could not Fully understand them. He, therefore, what does therefore do now? Okay, where can I find light? Oh, Jerusalem. He, therefore, went a journey to Jerusalem. To where? The temple. The conferences of churches. Watch now. Hungering and thirsting for knowledge. He laid his perplexities before whom? Priests and scribes. Let's read now. But he was still more mystified than before by their interpretations of Scripture that made the man more confused than before. That's the conference of that day, my friends. And then he prayed and God sent Philip to him. My friends... Again, it's one thing to say, those people, but how are we to respond to this? Lord, help me to be prepared. That if people, not if, when people come seeking, what is true worship? What is the Sabbath? Which day is the Sabbath? How do I learn of Christ for myself? Lord, help me to be ready and able to communicate the theory to them and give them my testimony Amen. of how I am being converted. Amen. That's how we are to respond, my friends. Do you have family members who are asking for truth? Yes, there are some. Look at this now. Skip on down. It says in verse 30, my brother, what was that you not reading? Why was he reading it? What, what was he seeking for? Right. Truth. Verse 30. Look at verse 30. And Philip ran there to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah. And Philip said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And what did the eunuch say? How can I accept some man do what? Guide me. Was he studying? Yes. But what did he need? Guidance. That's it, friends. So what are the other sheep doing right now? No, they're going to Disney World. So who are the other sheep God is going to bring in? What are they now doing like the Ethiopian eunuch? What are they doing? Hmm? 
they are not in the nonsense in the world. They are literally studying their Bibles diligently. And let me tell you something. There are some Christians right now in the Baptist Church, Roman Catholic Church, Church of God, Pentecostal, you, all that comprised Babylon, they are more spiritual than many of us in the SDA Church. That eunuch was more spiritual than those in Jerusalem. The other sheep were coming in. And what the eunuch said to Philip is what we must give to those people. He was seeking all he needed was a little more guidance. People in the world, in the Christian world, my friend, they are studying. They are living truth. Many of them are dress reformers, more than many of us in the SDA church. Women, don't wear pants, no makeup, no jewelry. There are some groups right now, Church of God, they don't wear the abominable garment we see the woman in the SDA church is wearing. They have different points of truth and all they need is for somebody else to come and give them the missing link. Amen. And that's where we come in. Amen. We? We who? Not them. We must say, Lord, help me to be prepared. Watch this. What happened to the eunuch? What did Philip do for him and do to him? Was he baptized? Was the eunuch baptized to sit down? What happened? We are told that eunuch became the first evangelist in Ethiopia. The evangelist of Africa. Look at the statement, my friends. In that time period, the first. In that time period, the eunuch was a man of good repute and occupied a high and responsible position through his what? Conversion, the gospel was carried to where? Ethiopia. And many in Ethiopia accepted Christ and came out from the darkness of heathenism into the clear light of Christianity. I want to ask you a question. Did Christ lead the Ethiopian eunuch to go and sit under the Sanhedrin Council of Synagogues? Oh. Hold on. Before the crucifixion, did Christ win the woman from Samaria, the men from Samaria, and tell them, come on, follow me. Uh, I'm Caiaphas, Anna, I got some new members for the church. Is that what Jesus did, my friends? No, he left them where they were. But what did they have? John 4, 24, Thou must worship the Lord in spirit and in truth, for God the Father seeketh such to worship him. And watch, when the eunuch came in, did he come to sit down? What happened? He joined the work of evangelism. When I ask a question, when the other sheep come into present truth, post the son of the law, what do they come in? And in turn, what do they go out to do? Evangelize. That means the other sheep represent the 11th hour workers. Hold on. A, a different study. I can't go there right now. They are coming in. At the 11th hour, my friends, they're coming in. And they will take the place of many. <laughs> lukewarm and lukewarm still, Seventh-day Adventists. Hold on. Can you tell me anybody else who was gathered in once the former rain fell, Pentecost came beside the eunuch? Who else came in, friends? Who else? Anybody else in the book of Acts? Don't tell me Saul who became Paul. Anybody else, friends? Anybody? Okay, I'll give you a hint. He brought in his household. The centurion. What was his name? Cor Cornelius. Go to Acts chapter 10. And what do you remember about Cornelius? How does the Bible describe Cornelius? The Bible says he was devout. What else? 
Okay, scan verse 1, Acts 10, go there, Acts 10, look at verse 1, look at verse 2, verse 1 and verse 2, what was said of Cornelius? Come on, he what? He was devout, put down devout, what else? He feared God, what else? He prayed always, what else my friends? Something else, what else? Come on, men, fathers talk to me, men, husbands. Talk to me. What else? Come on, husband. Husband, talk to me. You are women. You are wives. You are mothers. Men, talk to me. Come on. Cornelius, what happened? He set his household in order. My friends, so who would comprise the other sheep coming in? People who are now, April 24th, devout. And you say, oh, you don't, they don't keep the Sabbath. Cornelius was not a Sabbath keeper at this time. But in God's eyes, how was he? Devout. He feared God. All his household. He prayed to God always. He gave alms. He was very charitable. He wasn't selfish. Have you been selfish recently, friends? Have you? You're going to be sifted out. Because love is akin to generosity, kindness. That is the character of Christ. Cornelius, my friend, again, he was brought in. Question, if these people are coming in with those characteristic traits, what traits of character should we have? That's the traits of character of those who are coming in. Would Christ expect any less from us? So who must also be devout? Devout means what, my friends? Pious, religious, dedicated, reverent. <laughs> Listen to me. Parents, make sure your children are reverent in the time of worship. At home, so they can be reverent in church, God fearing, spiritual, prayerful, holy, godly, righteous. Lord, make me devout. What do you say, friends? Lord, make me devout. The other sheep who are coming in will be devout. What about those calling them in? What about those calling them in? We must also be devout. Okay, he feared God. What does fear God mean? What does fear God mean, friends? What does fear God mean? To hate evil. What texts say that? Fear God means to hate evil. Huh? Proverbs 8 and verse 13, put that down. Fear God. Examine yourself, my friends. Do I fear God? They're coming in. Do I fear God who is within now? Do I fear God? What else is fear God? What text comes to mind, fear God? What was Cornelius receiving? Cornelius had already began to receive the first angel's message. Fear God and give glory to him. He began to receive the first angel's message, but he had some missing links. What does give glory to God mean? Whatever you do, eat, drink, and do, do all to God's glory. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 31. You have people now in Babylon who don't eat flesh foods, don't eat dairy products. They don't snack between their regular meals. They are coming in. But we have professed Seventh-day Adventists who are chewing down their meat, their flesh food, and their dairy products, and their chocolate, and drinking their coffee. Probation is going to close on you. It's time for self-examination. They are coming in. They are coming in. And that's why God cannot bring them in now. Because many of us have backslidden on the point of health reform. 
volume 6, page 371. I gave it to you, page 370 and page 371. To fear God means to receive former rain. Go to Jeremiah chapter 5. Those who fear God receive the former rain, the Bible says, my friends. Yes, and Cornelius, it says, Cornelius prepared his household. What is God saying to fathers? Huh? You're not going to be in the group calling in the other sheep if you do not prepare your household. Fathers, front and center. Amen. Set your house in order. Cornelius, that means you have homes in Babylon. The household is more spiritual than those in modern Israel, Seventh-day Adventists. And they're coming in to take our places. It's time to wake up. He prayed always, evening, morning, and at noon. You have homes in Babylon. They pray mornings and evenings. They have family worship, yet we have SDA families, homes, who don't have worship in their homes. If there's any worship, it, it may be Friday sunset. That's it. No worship in the home. Again, it's one thing to say, those people, my friends, Lord, it is me standing in the need of prayer. I need to pray more. Often. How do I pray, Lord? How do I pray? This week, during midday power surge, I spent almost one full hour showing my testimony from the Bible, from the Spirit of Prophecy, how to have unbroken communion with Jesus, how to pray, how to be filled with God's Spirit. Just click on the YouTube channel. Go to the playlist, Former and Latter Rain, and look for the one that says Class in Session. Class in Session. That's the message, friends. Bypass the current events. Click on it. There's a minute marker. Click the minute marker, and that's where the Bible study begins. Do I pray always? Am I converted? They're coming in. Do you know what God told Cornelius? Go and call for Peter. When Peter comes, what will Peter do for you? Look at verse 6. Come to verse 6 of Acts 10. He lodgeth with one, Simon, a tanner whose house is by the seaside. Let's read now. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. But my friends, Cornelius was already converted, but he had some missing links. People in Babylon, many of them are already converted, but not fully. We have the missing principles of truth to now settle them in present truth. My friends, Lord, prepare me. What do you say? Lord, prepare us. What happened to Cornelius by Peter as the Enoch, the eunuch, by Philip? What happened to Cornelius and his household afterwards? Was he baptized? The Bible says Cornelius received the former rain. Look at Acts 10 with me. Acts 10. Look at verse 34. Look at verse 35, which confirms Cornelius was already experiencing righteousness. Did you hear me, my friends? Cornelius was already experiencing righteousness. That's verse 34 and verse 35. Go to verse 44. Verse 44, what fell upon Cornelius while Peter was speaking? Talk to me. The Holy Ghost fell upon Cornelius and his household. My friends, what Holy Ghost fell upon him? Was it the same that they received in the upper room? Or was it a different Holy Ghost? How do you know it was the same? How do you know? How do you know? 
Look with me, verse 47. Can, verse 47, can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received, what now? The Holy Ghost as well as we. That's it. What did they receive in the upper room, Peter? And the 120? The former rain. So what did Cornelius receive that day? So my friends, when the other sheep hear the loud cry, what would they receive? What would they receive? Which rain would they receive? Former or ladder? Which one? Why do you say ladder? Because they're now receiving the former. What's the former rain experience, my brother? It's victory over sin. And Cornelius was already a devout man. Working righteousness. The other sheep who were coming in. Hold on there. How did God prepare Peter to evangelize Cornelius and his household? What did God give to Peter? A vision, a dream. Can you tell me what you remember about the vision and dream? Anybody? Just give me a chorus, anything. He saw a sheet and Nick coming down with all type of unclean animals. And what did he hear? Rise, Peter! Kill and barbecue! Lord have mercy upon us. And what was Peter's response? I've never eaten anything common or unclean. Mm -hmm. What now? Common or? Unclean. One more time. Common or? Unclean. Unclean. And what did God say to Peter afterwards? What did the vision mean? Not animals. He was talking about people. people. So who was the unclean to the Jews? The Gentiles. Cornelius, don't call them unclean as if there is no hope for their salvation because I am going to bring in the unclean. What text comes to your mind? Revelation chapter 18. Come on now. Babylon is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils, the the hold of every foul spirit, the cage of every unclean. So who is in Babylon? Unclean. But what says verse 4? But what says verse 4? Come out of her, my people. Come out. Are they coming out? But all we say, we are Seventh-day Advent. Ba Babylon, they're lost, huh? No, you are lost with those sentiments. You are lost. Oh, my friends, watch this point, friends. How long did it take the disciples to understand who Christ was and to receive the Pentecostal shower, the former? How long it took them? How long was Christ with them? How long it took them, friends? Beloved, it took them three and a half years to understand whom, who Christ was, to understand his ministry, and to receive the former reign. Three and a half years. How long did Peter spend with Cornelius to get him ready to receive the former rain. How long? How long? One day. One day. One day. One day. How long was Philip with the Ethiopian eunuch before he could receive baptism and God's spirit? How long? Not even one day. My, 
the harvest was already ripe. Yes, I'm shouting, one day. Do you know why? When the latter rain falls. How long are we going to take to give the other sheep Bible studies to get them ready to receive the latter rain? How long? Three and a half years, right? Six years, right? One year. Not even a day. That's how great the latter rain is going to be, my friend. What took them three and a half years to learn? It took, the, the, it took Cornelius, the eunuch, how long? One day. How long did it take you to master the English language? Still learning? Did you come out the come out the womb, start talking fluently? How long it took you, friends? Here's my point. How long did it take the disciples, the apostles, to learn all those tongues? How long? How long? Not even one day. What a difference the rain makes. One day. They learn all those, those languages. What is God saying to us, my friends? Just prepare yourselves. God is going to work supernaturally to get us ready for these last days. How many months do you think separate former rain from latter rain? How many months do you think the Bible says? Do you want to say, huh? Hillary, Sister Enriquez. The Bible says three to four months. Why is that important? Because the book of Joel says God is going to give us former rain and latter rain in the same month. So what was natural, at least four months that separates former rain, from latter rain, God says, when latter rain comes, you get both quickly. Amen. Do you want to see it, my friends? Go to Amos chapter 4. Quickly as we close. Where are we going to, my friends? Amos chapter 4. The next time you see your family member, that Sunday keeper, just remember, they might be the ones coming in. So do not condemn them. But also give them a warning. Don't think you can fool God. Because God knows if what I'm sharing with you, my family member, if it connects, God knows. God knows. But if they, by God's grace, are chosen not to come in now, they are coming in later. You just remain faithful. Amos chapter 4. Where are we going to, my friends? Now, please, watch it. Go to verse 7. How many months are in verse 7? How many months? Verse 7. How many months? Three. Three months. Before harvest. Which rain comes just before harvest? Former or latter? Latter. Then harvest. That means at least three months between the former and latter because latter comes just before harvest. I'll give you one more scripture. Go to John chapter 4. I'm closing. Where are we going to, my friends? John chapter 4. Look at verse 35 with me. John chapter 4. Praise God, my friends. Just make, listen to me, husbands, fathers, just prepare your home. Cornelius prepared his home that his children receive the Holy Ghost. Amen. John chapter 4. Mothers. Front and center. Mothers. Amen, mothers. Raise your hand, mothers. Yes. Amen. Verse 35. How many months are in verse 35? How many months? Four months. Let's read that. Jesus says, there are yet. No. He says, say not ye. There are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, Lift up your eyes. Look on the fees. Why? For they are white. Already to be what? Harvested. 
at least four months and then harvest. You can have harvest before you sow the seed. And when you sow the seed, what rain falls? Former rain. At least three to four months between former and latter. But the Bible says now in Joel, Joel chapter 2, I'll give you former and latter in the first month. Oh, beloved. Joel chapter 2. Look at verse 23. Be glad then, God's people. Rejoice in your God. Why? He hath given you the former rain moderately. He will cause to come down for you the rain. Let's read. The former rain and the latter rain. In what time? That doesn't make sense. Former and latter cannot fall in the same month. God is going to work how? Not naturally, but how? Supernaturally. Early writings. Page 67. It says, red words, but now time is almost finished. And what we have been years learning, they will have to learn in a few months. That's laddering, friends. What took us years to learn? And that's why we must study our Bibles to know how to crunch the data. Let me give a biblical language. <laughs> to sharpen the sword so we can present a whole lot in a short space of time. Because when the sun the law passed, we are told the final movements are going to be what? Slow ones, right? No, rapid ones. That's why every question I ask, I ask you with a Bible to confirm. My friends, they, blue words, they also, they will also have much to unlearn. And much to what? Learn again. Listen to this, my friends. Oh, beloved, as trials sticking around us, both separation and unity will be seen in our ranks. But on the other hand, when the storm of persecution really breaks upon us, son the law, the true whom? Come on. The true sheep will hear the true shepherd's voice. Self-denying efforts will be put forth to save the lost. Amen. And let's read blue words. And... And many who have strayed from the fold will come back to follow the great shepherd of the sheep I have, which are not of this fold. I'm going to bring them in. They will hear my voice. One fold, one church, one shepherd. Are they coming in? That statement is for SDAs. There are many who have left Jesus and present truth. A handful of them are coming back in. The majority who have left are not coming back. A handful are coming back in. Here's my appeal. Don't go anywhere. Amen. Jesus, to whom shall I go? Yes. To whom? Lord, I will not let you go until you bless me. Judas left and never returned. Don't play games. Today, give God your all. I've wandered far away from God. But now, I'm coming home. I'm coming home. The paths of sin. Too long I've trod. But Lord, I'm coming home. 